Now we can expand our discussion of international trade to account for the fact that countries aren't just given goods that they can trade, they have to produce them. To do this, we need to introduce two important new concepts, the production possibilities frontier and comparative advantage. Let's start with the concept of the production possibilities frontier. So far we've discussed production functions in which a firm produces one good, golden snitches or cars or roses for example. That firm chooses a quantity of that one good to produce in order to maximize profit. When we talk about trade, we have to talk about firms, or in this case countries, that produce multiple goods. For a country with a given set of natural resources to work with, there will typically be a trade-off. Producing more of one good means producing less of another. The Productions Possibilities Frontier, or PPF, allows us to model this trade-off. For a country producing two goods with a given set of inputs, the PPF shows the maximum quantity of one good that can be produced for each possible quantity of the other good produced. Think about yourself as a firm. Let's focus on two outputs you have as a firm, homework and exam study. You have a given amount of inputs, your time and brain power. And let's assume that you're using these inputs as efficiently as possible. That is, whether you're producing homework or studying for exams, you're using the most efficient mix of time and brain power to do so. Suppose that in a certain course you have 10 homework assignments worth 20 points each and two exams worth 100 points each. And suppose that the best you can do, given your limited time, is to do a perfect job on all the homework and blow off the both exams, or do a perfect job on the exams and blow off all the homework. Or you can do some combination of the two and do a pretty good job on both. This graph shows the trade-off in a simple case. The horizontal axis shows the total points you earn on homework up to a maximum of 200 points for the 10 homework assignments times 20 points each. The vertical axis shows the total points you earn in the exams, also up to a maximum of 200 points for the two exams times 100 points each. This is like the typical trade-off graph we've seen for consumers deciding between two goods to consume, but now it's for producers deciding between two goods to produce. In this case, you are the producer. In this simple case, you can earn full points of the homework and get a zero on the exams. Or you can earn full points on the exams and get a zero on the homework. Or you can get some linear combination of the two, like 100 points on the homework and 100 points on the exam. But suppose that doing the homework makes it easier to study for the exams, and studying for the exams makes it easier to do the homework. If you do all the homework and get perfect scores, surely some of what you learned will help on the exams. And if you study so much that you get perfect scores in the exams, surely it won't be that difficult to do some of the homework covering the same material. In this case, it is costlier in terms of time and brain power to produce each product in isolation than is to produce them jointly. That is, producing homework helps you produce exam studying and vice versa. We call this economies of scope. Graphically, this is represented by a convex production possibility frontier that pushes out like this. As you move from producing just homework or just exam studying to producing both, you're able to produce more total output. This graph shows that by focusing on just homework or just exams, you still are only able to get a maximum of 200 points. But if you do some of both, because of economies of scope, you can increase your total points, say to 300, with 150 each from homework and exams. Economies of scope are often called synergies. These synergies are the source of many firm mergers and acquisitions. Two firms producing different products might do better jointly than they'll do individually, creating incentives to merge the two firms. Now we can also have diseconomies of scope. For example, when I was in college, I was on the tennis team. At one point, I decided to try playing squash as well. I hoped that this would add economies of scope, and I'd be better at both. By playing more tennis, I hoped I'd get better at squash. And by playing more squash, I hoped I'd get better at tennis. But in tennis, it's important not to use your wrist when you stroke the ball. In squash, however, it turns out that it's all about using your wrist. By playing squash, I actually messed up my tennis game and vice versa. This diseconomy of scope is the very reason I never turned pro in tennis. Okay, it was one of the many reasons I never turned pro in tennis, but you get the point. The second concept important for understanding international trade is that of comparative advantage. A country that has a comparative advantage in producing a good, if it can produce that good at a lower opportunity cost 
than can any other country. Let's take a simple example of only two countries, the US and Colombia. And let's say each country produces only two goods, roses for Valentine's Day and computers. Resources devoted to producing one good can't be devoted to producing the other. So the opportunity cost of producing a rose is producing fewer computers. And the opportunity cost of producing computers is producing fewer roses. Now it turns out that it's very costly for the US to grow roses in February, but it's cheap for Colombia. At the same time, it's cheaper for the US to produce computers than it is for Colombia, because the US has a bigger skilled labor force and better technology for computer production. As a result, if the US wanted to produce roses instead of computers, it would have to give up a lot of computers. It would have to take people who are really good at making computers and have them set up expensive greenhouses. It wouldn't end up with all that many roses, but now there are a lot of computers that aren't getting produced anymore. And if Colombia wanted to produce computers instead of roses, it would have to give up a lot of roses. It would have to take people who are really good at growing roses and get them to work on making computers. It wouldn't end up with that many computers, but now there are a lot of roses that aren't getting produced anymore. In economic terms, we say that the opportunity cost of producing a rose in terms of computers that could have been produced instead is lower for Colombia than it is for the US. So we say that Colombia has a comparative advantage over the US in rose production. And the flip side is that the opportunity cost of producing a computer in terms of roses that could have been produced instead is lower for the US than it is for Colombia. The US has a comparative advantage over Colombia in computer production. These comparative advantages come from a couple of sources. First, countries can differ in factor endowments that can be used for production. For example, Canada and the US are similar in many ways, but Canada is a much bigger exporter of lumber and paper products. This is because so much more of Canada is covered in forests, giving Canada a comparative advantage in that sector. Differences in factor endowments also explain why most clothing now comes from China. The main input for clothing production is labor to sew the clothes, and China has lots of labor. The second source of comparative advantage is differences in technology. For example, Japan is a major exporter of automobiles, despite no natural advantage in factor endowments. But Japan was a leader in developing the technology for the modern automobile. As a result, it became cheaper to produce quality cars in Japan than in many other countries. This gave Japan a comparative advantage in car production. In the next lecture, we'll see how these concepts, the production possibilities frontier and comparative advantage, help us understand the power of international trade.